So I'll, I'll just get started. So Salim al -Haq, you are a, a Bangladeshi British scientist. You're an expert in the field of climate change, environment and development. Um, you've been the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development uh, based in Bangladesh, also a professor at independent university in Bangladesh, as well as a lead author and contributor for a number of IPCC's uh, assessment reports. You're a senior fellow at the International Institute for Environment and Development, IIED in the UK, and a senior advisor with the Global Centre on Adaptation. And you've received a number of awards over the years, um, most recently uh, an OBE from the UK Government for Services to Combating Climate Change, which is very impressive. Have I, have I, got, have I missed anything? <laughs> that, that sounds fine. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Terrific. So just jumping straight in then, um, could you explain uh, a little uh, why or how climate change affects human rights, particularly for developing countries? I think the issue of human rights and climate change are actually very intimately interlinked. Uh, for a long time, this was not recognized, but it is now increasingly recognized. And the way in which it, it, it uh, is interlinked, very simply, is impacts of climate change are caused by the emissions of rich people, mostly living in rich countries, but those impacts are being felt and the victims are poor people, mostly living in poor countries. And that's not right. That's not just uh, you know, a human rights violation, it's, it's an injustice, a manifest injustice. And increasingly, this is now being recognized, including by the, uh, the Pope himself in his Laudato Si. He has made this very clear that it is not morally correct. And he has enjoined Catholics around the world to take actions individually as moral actions, that this is a immoral action that we must oppose. Similarly, other faiths have done this. The Muslim clergy, we don't have a, a Pope equivalent in Islam, but we have uh, uh, higher authorities who have come together and they have made a similar statement saying that as Muslims, we must abide by the teachings of the Quran, which says we must not harm our fellow human beings. And in, in fact, we must help those who are poor and who are suffering. And so this is really a moral question for every individual, whether they're religious or not religious, of not accepting this unjust situation. And it is a violation of the human rights of the poorest people on the planet by the richest people on the planet. And that just can't be allowed. Yeah, well, that, which leads me to the to my next question, which is, you know, as you observed, um, a lot of the a lot of the, the wealth is currently uh, in the global north. Um, and how would you like to see how would you like to see these countries in these regions respond to these challenges? And what should they be doing to help not just themselves, but to help the, the, the rest of the world? So I'd, I'd make two um, separate um cases for who needs to help whom. The, the one that is most um, talked about is the North versus the South. So the global North versus global South, the global North causing the problem, global South suffering the consequences, and therefore the global North owes it to the global South. That is actually not uh, disputed. The global North accepts they have a responsibility. They have promised to give money. They're not delivering on that promise, but they are acknowledging their uh, obligation and they uh, uh, are promising to give money. But there is another divide that is less talked about, which is within countries. And every country in the world, not just poor countries, but rich countries as well, countries like in Europe or in uh, America, when the impacts of climate change happen at the country level, and they're happening now every single day, every week, the impacts fall mostly on the poorest people in those countries. And to give you a very stark example, when Hurricane Katrina hit the city of New, Orle New Orleans a number of years ago, more than a thousand people lost their lives. Every single one of them was a poor black citizen of the ninth ward of New Orleans. Not one 
white better off person in New Orleans lost their life. All right. And that is the level of the injustice that is taking place. It's inside countries as well as globally. And it needs to be tackled at both these scales. And in the case of Europe, the same thing applies. The people who suffer are the poorest people. And the people who make decisions are the rich people. And they are making decisions that are causing their own poor citizens to suffer. That's not right. And can you could you talk so could you tell us a little bit about your work and your involvement in this area? You have not you and I have known one another for for many years, and uh, and uh, I'm I'm familiar with uh, with with some of what you've done. Um, certainly in the in the context of the UN climate talks, but I'd love it if you could maybe just tell us tell um tell uh, folks watching this uh, kind of uh, you know what 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 you've been working on in Bangladesh internationally and uh, you know elsewhere. Sure. So I'll I'll describe uh, three quite different but related hats that I wear on different occasions. Right. Yeah. I'll start with my scientific hat, uh, which you alluded to in the introduction. I have been a lead author and a coordinating lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the third assessment report, the fourth assessment report, and then the fifth assessment report. So for many years, not the latest six assessment reports. Um, and in that capacity, I've been writing a lot of the scientific uh, literature, particularly when it comes to adaptation to climate change, impacts on poor countries and how they can adapt. So that's like my scientific uh, level of expertise, as it were, adaptation to climate change, particularly in poor countries, but now even in rich countries, everybody's going to have to adapt. Uh, my second hat is at the global negotiations every year, uh, where you and I quite frequently meet at the annual conference of parties under the UN Framework Convention. I am one of the few people who's actually attended every single one of the wow. 27 COPs that have been held so far. And I hasten to add though that I don't go as a negotiator. I go as a observer, uh, as a researcher, as a professor, uh, but I do have a role in the negotiations as an advisor to the group of least developed countries who are 46 of the poorest, most vulnerable countries. They're a formal caucus group uh, currently chaired by Senegal. And I've been advising them for many, many years on the topics of adaptation, on climate finance, and now increasingly on the emerging topic of loss and damage and how to deal with it. But that's only two weeks out of the year, uh, every year. The, the, the remaining 50 weeks of the year, I'm based in Dhaka in Bangladesh, where I'm a professor in a university called the Independent University. I run a research center there called the International Center for Climate Change and Development. We have a master's program for climate change and development. We do a lot of uh, teaching short courses for uh, people from all over the world, particularly from the least developed countries. So I would call that my third hat as my most important hat where I actually work in country with vulnerable communities, trying to find ways to support them and enable them to be better able to cope with the impacts of climate change, which unfortunately are now already happening. And as I said earlier, it's a violation of their human rights, uh, which we need to take into account and uh, bring into that uh, diagnosis and uh, discussion. That's uh, very impressive. And, and just staying on Bangladesh for a moment, my understanding is that that uh, that in part due to your your leadership and, and other folks in, in the country who have, who have taken this issue very seriously for a long time, that Bangladesh is, has modeled and charted a path that, that many others are looking at. Um, uh, could you tell us maybe a little bit about that? Sure. So Bangladesh is uh, recognized globally as one of the most vulnerable countries to the impacts of climate change. And that's because we have a very large population, about 170 million people, it's the eighth largest uh, country by population in the world, but we live in a very tiny part of the world. The area of the country is less than 150,000 square kilometers, which is roughly the area of Wales in the UK. Um, and the top population density is well over a thousand 
per person, which you only find in big cities like uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, but in Bangladesh, it's yeah. the whole country. Um, and it's a very poor, poor population, relatively poor population, getting better, but still quite poor. And uh, the geography is such that we live on the the delta of two of the biggest rivers in the world, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra, which regularly flood. And we also suffer from cyclones that come from the Bay of Bengal to the coastal zone. So we are extremely vulnerable geographically uh, to the impacts of climate change, particularly cyclones and floods. Um, and because our people are, are relatively poor, the capacity to adapt is relatively low. Having said that, though, I would say that that is really the old story of Bangladesh. The new story of Bangladesh is that we have been taking climate change more seriously than any other country in the world, with the exception of the small islands who, for whom it's an existential threat. But for us, it's not an existential threat, but it is a massive threat. And so our country, from the prime minister to the finance minister to the environment minister to government agencies and non-government organizations and academic and researchers like myself, we have all been galvanized for at least a decade or more. And we are now moving forward in taking climate change with the seriousness that it deserves, which no other country is doing, by the way. <laughs> they, they are going to have to do it tomorrow. We're doing it today. And mm -hmm. as such, we are learning how to adapt. Uh, and in particular, the focus is on what we call locally led adaptation, which means working with the most vulnerable communities and enabling them to be better prepared rather than the opposite, which is top down adaptation where, you know, government and international agencies come and say, this is what you need to do and then tell us what to do. And half the time it doesn't work. And so, you know, there's this dichotomy between top down and bottom up adaptation efforts where we belong to the bottom up uh, uh, constituency saying that that is a better way to do. It's slower. It takes more time but it is a better way to get the results that you need, which is making everybody resilient to the impacts of climate change. And that is really the pathway that Bangladesh is. We call our story, yesterday's story being the most vulnerable country, today's story be being becoming the most resilient, and tomorrow is to become prosperous despite having the impacts of climate change. That's our aspiration. Brilliant, that is, and that's, it's, not only aspirational, but inspirational as well. So thank you for that. So so you're talking about, um, which kind of leads on to my last question, looking ahead and what, what you, your kind of vision for the future. Could we talk, maybe just, um, could you share kind of what you would, and we also spoke a little bit about what's happening internationally with the UN. You know, there's the loss and damage fund, which is supposed to be operationalized uh, this December at the next COP. Um, maybe I, I, I'd love to hear kind of what you would like to see happen next at the international level um, in terms of decisions made, in terms of actions that folks are committing to, maybe looking up to the next, this coming COP and then the following one in terms of kind of what you would like to see happen next to really kind of get us on track and, 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 and uh, help us achieve what we need to do. Great. So I've, I've been arguing now for some months that this year, 2023, is actually the first year of the new era of impacts of climate change happening. No longer something that's going to happen that we anticipate. It's already happening. And as it happens in the last few days, we had the hottest temperature ever in the whole world on the 3rd of July. And then on the 4th of July, that record got broken. And then on the 6th of July, that record got broken. So the, the first week of July is the hottest week ever in the history of the world. And that is the crossover of the threshold into global impacts of climate change happening now. Every single day, every week, every month, every year from now on, it's going to get worse, not better, worse. We can prevent the really bad things happening in the long term by reducing our emissions as we're supposed to do and promise to do. But in the near term, we can just adapt and be prepared for dealing with the losses and damages. And so what we now, what we used to call adaptation is effectively now minimizing loss and damage 
And then when loss and damage happens, then we have to deal with it. We call that addressing loss and damage. So the nexus is in adapting to minimize it, but then dealing with it once it happens. And uh, as we move forward to COP28 in Dubai, uh, where we have, we had a good decision last year in COP27 to create a new fund for loss and damage. We hope that that fund will be uh, up and coming and, and uh, um, start in, in Dubai and COP28 and go forward. But more importantly than that, I, I feel that the global leaders who will be coming to Dubai in December for COP28 need to have a very different frame of mind. They should not be thinking that they're coming to the 28th conference of parties of you know a 30 year old long uh, program and it's just business as usual. They're actually coming to the first conference of parties in the new era of impacts happening and causing losses and damages. And that has a very strong human rights effect because as I said, it's a problem caused by rich people everywhere, including rich people in poor countries like mine, but rich people in rich countries by and large, and the sufferers are poor people, mostly in poor countries, but even poor people in rich countries, including in Europe, are the sufferers. So, you know, whether you're a, a leader of your own country, you need to take that into account. And if you're a global leader you're coming to a global meeting, you need to take that into account. And so far, unfortunately, the leaders simply have not uh, got the message of how severe this problem is and is going to be. They'll get the message because the, the climate will give them the message, but talking to them has not given them the message. Well, we can uh, certainly hope that we get uh, get a strong outcome in, at COP28 and uh, and the global stock take, which is also occurring there. Hopefully, we'll get we'll get something uh, concrete from that. I know that's another another major goal. Well, thank you very much. Was there any any last words you'd like to uh, offer? Any other any other final thoughts or? Yes. So let me add one final thought uh, in terms of taking this issue forward. Um, I've emphasized the role of leaders coming to the annual conference of parties and not doing enough, promising to do things, but then not doing them. I think we need to do a much better uh, um, galvanization of global citizens, particularly young citizens across the world. Uh, I feel that that is really where the energy and the impetus for making a change uh, lies and will come from. They're already active all over the world in every country. They're connecting with each other globally. We just have to in enable them to become much, much, much more uh, useful and powerful and making the changes that are needed and insisting that the their own leaders make the changes that need to be done. So I am now investing a lot of my effort with younger people and I'm very happy to engage with any young people who want to get in touch with me to see how we can uh, make sure that they become a force to be reckoned with, not just advocacy, but a force. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Selena.